Hey guys, to another episode of Quarantine Watch Talk. As you can see today, I'm joined by two beautiful gentlemen, um, Balas and Robadian, two experienced watch collectors and faces of the industry. And in the next hour, we will talk you through uh, the top and flop releases from Watches and Wonder, Wonders 2020. And they will talk about their personal collection. And in the end, we will answer your user questions. Um, for example, which watch to buy right now and how to start a collection. So hang on until the end. But before we jump right in, um, let's do a quick uh, introduction round and a wristwatch check, of course. So maybe Robadian, you want to want to start? I, saw oh, I don't want to, but I can start. Yes. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm Robert Jan Broer. I'm the founder of uh, FratelloWatches.com. Um, I founded it in 2004, and uh, today we are an online magazine with uh, 12 people on board. And um, um, yeah, running fine, basically, uh, even during these times. And uh, I'm happy to be here on this uh, quarantine session with you guys, uh, together with my colleague, uh, Balash. Um, and um, do you also want to do a wrist check right, right away? Yeah, sure. Bring okay. it. So today I'm wearing, a, well, a Speedmaster, like I mostly do, basically. It's my gold Speedmaster Apollo, Apollo 11 from last year with the Moonshine Gold. And... Um, it's, an, it's a limited edition of 1,014 pieces, um, uh, paying uh, homage to the original one from 69, which was also 1,014 pieces. And uh, I have the same number as my uh, most favorite astronaut, number 13, which was Tom uh, Stafford. And uh, yeah, happy to have it. And I uh, wear it quite a lot. Um, I'm sure that you will wear this one today. Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I wear it a lot. And... Um, at first, when I bought it, when I ordered it, I thought it would be a nice piece for special occasions because it's full gold and perhaps not always appropriate and uh, perhaps not always suitable. Well, I let the appropriate slide because I don't care. And um, for, uh, yeah, suitable, I don't have a really uh, a daring job, uh, bungee jumping or diving or whatsoever. I mainly in the office are traveling. Well, not right now, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite good with the, with the watch and only scratch it it gets is from from the my desk basically and um, so yeah i wear it a lot almost uh, uh, non-stop sometimes I, I swap it with some other watches and of course we get a lot of watches for review so i wear those as well but uh, yeah at the end of the day i uh, i put this one on yeah great and balance you wearing your gmt no, I'm not wearing my GMT because it's not uh, at home at the moment. Um, so my name is Balash Ferenzi. I'm, as RJ said, one of the um, uh, the editors of Fratello since 2014, July-ish. So about six years now, five and a half, six years now. Um, I'm based in Germany, as you are, Pascal. And of course, many of us have, um, or many of you guys have seen us together, like Pascal and me, in some of the videos. So. Uh, some of the Chrono 24 videos. This is probably where you uh, might also might have seen me before. Um, my watch is not as uh, cool as RJ's, um, or one would think it's a different cool watch. It's a 1960s, late 1960s Doxa uh, Sub 300 uh, Shark Hunter Aqualung that has a little Aqualung logo at the eight o'clock position, and this is the pre synchron era um aqualung which uh um Docs of 300 aqualung which is um i think well maybe not the rarest watch out there but it's it's pretty rare because um it really comes from the time uh shortly after uh, doxa swapped from the sub 300 uh to the sub 300 t but before the synchron um, era came um, so it has the Doxa case back and actually just the other day I had a nice uh, Instagram chat with some fellow um, Doxa fans and collectors and um, I just thought it's going to be appropriate to wear the watch today. So um, so we heard that you are the founder of Fratello Watches and um, the creator of Speedy Tuesday and Balash yeah. is working for Fratello. Um, so how's business going these days? I think you're still in all in home office, the whole team, I would say, but I would guess. Yeah, we have a, a central office in the in the Hague, and I go there once in a while. We have a shared office center, so we have our own um, um, uh, offices um, where we are, and we still go to the office because I can't work all the time from home because I have a, a young daughter, 
um, and a wife and they also need to be in the up I live now in an apartment so it's a bit uh, yeah small to be with the three of us together here so my wife and daughter are at home I go to the office I escape more or less <laughs> and then I go to the office and we have um, one of the other guys Bert our photographer and the guy who does the videos he's also in the in the office uh, a few days a week and um, yeah we discuss and we meet we of course we keep the distance um, we have he, I'm in the Netherlands so we have this one and a half meter um, uh, distance uh, rule and uh, yeah we keep that um, in, yeah we we uh, we, uh, we honor that rule and um, and that's okay I think yeah yeah and um, the other question Pascal you asked about Speedy Tuesday um, I founded it in uh, in 2012 and we started with the team actually to write about uh, Speedmasters um, every week on a Tuesday uh on, on fratello and uh, yeah that that really became a big thing and it, it it's not something that we planned it was just uh it sounded good speedy tuesday i took a picture of a watch when i was on a holiday and i put it online and on a in a facebook group yeah, which was the first one for the yeah the og <laughs> speedy tuesday watch. yeah so I, I i was just a normal speedmaster just a normal moon wedge i i think it was the one i have from 1968 and i brought it with me on a holiday and I, I took a picture on, of the watch on my wrist and put it online. And I, I did a caption, it's Speedy Tuesday. And immediately it gave me the idea to um, create an article on Fratello um, about Speedmasters. And I, first I did once every three weeks or every four weeks. But we, get, we got so many responses and, and questions and emails from, from readers that I decided to do it like every week. And I have done it uh, ever since and sometimes Balash takes over or Michael or some of the other editors um, and it really became a thing and especially as soon as we started to to share the articles or the picture with the hashtag Speedy Tuesday on Instagram then it really took off because people they start to reuse the hashtag and it has been used over 200,000 times and uh, people really use it to post their their Speedmaster and they also use it to find other Speedmaster enthusiasts and collectors so it's a community. I don't say Speedy Tuesday is particularly the name of the community, but it's it's the identifier. So people can use this hashtag to find other enthusiasts or fans uh, uh, posting their Speedmasters online. And of course, we keep publishing our Speedy Tuesday stories. Um, and we do events. Uh, we started doing events in 2013 for the first time uh, here in the Netherlands at the European Space Agency Visitor Center. And um, later on, we, we put Omega in the mix as well, because they are able to get cool guests there, like astronauts that were on the moon or um, more recent astronauts that went to the International Space Station. And they, they, they will share a story, their experience, and um, the guests of the Speedy Tuesday events, they can really be in touch with these astronauts and ask questions and be on a picture. And uh, it would be just, just the hashtag in the meanwhile, because... You also have a watch, Speedy Tuesday watch. Um, yeah, so in, in 2016, we approached uh, the, the, the then new CEO, uh, Reynold Ashleyman from Omega. Um, yeah, that, that we would be having our fifth anniversary in 2017. And I, I asked him if we could do something special and not a, not a, a T-shirt or a pen or a, a button, but a watch. And then he said, "Yeah, sure, why not?" And he liked the idea, and uh, we, um, yeah, we needed to come up with a with a proposal. So we did. We we made a few sketches and Photoshop uh, um, uh, mock-ups, and uh, the result was uh, is this uh, this Speedy Tuesday that perhaps most of the viewers will know. And it was released in 2017 on uh, January 10, 10, and it um, it was uh, booked all 2012 pieces. Um, relating to the first year of Speedy Tuesday, uh, were sold in four and a half hours. And then one year later, we did another one, uh, a homage to the Ultraman Speedmasters. Let me give it a bit to the light with some, with some orange elements and things. And that, that one was uh, gone in, in like... I want one too. <laughs> within two hours, like one hour in, uh, in, in 45 minutes or something. And it's really cool. The whole process was cool. And it was a, really a surprise that Omega wants to do this with us uh, because we were the first to, to do something uh, as a community uh, uh, with them. And um, it was also the first online sale for them, which was quite exciting. And they took that as a, 
also a bit as a pilot to do their online sales starting in the US and they recently opened up in, uh, in Europe, for example, as well. Um, so it was a lot of firsts and uh, yeah, it's really a cool watch. It's a homage to the Alaska 3, which was a Speedmaster from 1978. And that's basically, as you know, the Speedmaster was selected for uh, Apollo missions um, and it became the, the moon watch. And then when the space shuttle program came in 1981, they needed another watch or a new watch for, for the astronauts for the space shuttle program. So in, in 78, they, they did the tender again that they did in, uh, in, in 65. And um, now they got the watch from Omega with a new caliber, the 861. And um, they had some other watches uh, sent in as well. And they, they tested again, and th the watch was again requalified for, um, for use by NASA. And that project was called Alaska 3. So all the NASA projects that Omega did were called Alaska. And this was the third project, so Alaska 3. And um, uh, at the start of Speedy Tuesday in 2012, I got in touch with a Dutch astronaut and he said, I have a few watches and one of them is a Speedmaster, but I don't know exactly what it is. Oh, well, actually, were two Speedmasters, one X33 and uh, a, a, a different Speedmaster. And um, his son came over to my house and he, he, with a plastic bag, I kid you not, and he just put it upside down on the kitchen table and out fell a bunch of watches. And um, two of them were the Omegas, and one of them was the Omega with strange inscriptions on the case back. And I recognized that there were NASA inscriptions, and not the NASA inscription that says first, uh, first watch worn on the moon, but it were numbers, product numbers. And uh, so I sent Omega an email, and they, they called me right away, and they said, how did you get the watch? Because that's really special, because that's one of the 56 watches that we sent in 78 to NASA for the space shuttle program. So apparently his father, the astronaut, got it through another astronaut <laughs> and they just did, never returned it to NASA. They, they used it during some testing uh, for the mission in 85 that they were on and they just never returned the watch. And, um, and that was the Alaska 3 watch and that was input for us to, to come up with our Speedy Tuesday because that watch also had the, the radial dial that the Speedy Tuesday has as well. And we didn't want to replicate the thing one, one to one so we added this, uh, this uh, reverse Panda dial and Omega added uh, the, the fully brushed case. Um, and we, we went back and forth for, uh, in, in, in the design and we came up with this watch. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really something that, that's close to the heart basically. And then the other one, the Ultraman, is homage to the, to the Speedmaster Ultraman from uh, 68. Uh, Ultraman was this superhero series in, uh, in Japan. And... Um, the actors or the, 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 the characters in, in Ultraman, they, uh, they wore the Speedmaster and just a normal Speedmaster with the orange hand. And these watches are so sought after by collectors mm. that we thought it would be very nice to do something special there and come up with a, with a geeky version with the orange hand, but also with the, with the head of the Ultraman in the subdial. If you put a UV light on it, you will see the head appear on the dial. The and there are a few other gimmicks there on the, on the dial. And um, so those are the two Speedy Tuesday watches. But Speedy Tuesday is more than these watches or more than just a hashtag. It's really a community um, label, basically, and brings uh, enthusiasts together during the events and on Instagram or other social media to discuss the Speedmaster. And a lot of discussions also evolve around uh, the moon program or space in, in general. It's really cool. There's a Facebook group. Um, called speed, hashtag Speedy Tuesday. It's not mine. It's uh, it's uh, run by some someone else. I am in there and I'm quite active. But it's really fun to be in there with a few thousand people, and it's all friendly. It's really amazing because a lot of these forums and Facebook groups sometimes you get like nasty discussions, but here it's it's super friendly and it's a really um, yeah bonding collectors and enthusiasts. You guys are cool and friendly guys. Cool and friendly guys like us, not Balash, but me. Do you think this it would have worked also with another watch, or do you think it's? I don't know. I I mean, I, we were not the first. I mean, um, credits where credits are due. I think Panaristi was first with this, and there was also like a Panaristi uh, uh, watch uh, boutique special, I think, for New York. Um, and I, I I I attended one of these Panar P days. They do P days for Panaristis. They have this annual events. Uh, I, I visit the number four, number five in Frankfurt. I think it was 2004 or 2005. 
And it was quite cool. And it was a similar kind of thing. And it's still out there. I recently had an interview with the, the new CEO or the, re, the current CEO of Panerai. And I asked him about it. And it's still very much alive and active. And they, they are more or less also a sounding board for their designers. Mm. Um, so it works for different watches. It works for Panerai, I think. It could work for, for some other models. We have been asked by a number of brands. When we did the Speedy Tuesday and when the watch came out, we were uh, contacted by a lot of brands because they saw the success and they said, oh, we want to do something similar. Can, can we do like a, I don't, I don't want to mention any brands or models, but can we do uh, this and this Thursday or this and this Friday? But we all, always pushed it back because it's not genuine to us. Yeah. We are Speedy guys. I mean, Balash has his Speedmasters. We have... I think in total with the entire Fratello team, I think we are over 100 Speedmasters. Um, it's really close to us and it doesn't make sense for us to, to come up with another kind of thing that, that would make it uh, credible. Um, but yeah, sure. I think for, for, for Pan Panerai, there's something similar. I think there's a huge Rolex collector's community, but it's a bit more spread out. Um, I know that in Japan, they have this Grand Seiko club that's really popular and they have a special website run by Grand Seiko. So it's really, I think a more or less of a brand thing, but they really do something special for these uh, uh, collectors. So yeah, definitely possible, but there are also a lot of brands that, yeah, it's not possible uh, for, for these brands because they are a brand that people just buy, buy one watch and then move on to the next watch or that, that are not consistent enough in their, in their model designs that change models too often or don't have a, a, an icon, for example. But I could also imagine that it's the history of the Speedmaster that helps to grow a, a strong community, don't you think? And yeah. in, in, uh, um, the Dutchmen also love Omega. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe this also helped to grow the community faster? Or am I wrong? I don't know. Omega is a collectible brand, I think. But so is Rolex or, or Patek or uh, many other brands. But I think... Um, it's a sympathetic brand and you can, you can, uh, there are uh, Omega watches that you can buy for four or 500 euros. That is really a, a, a cool watch. And so it's really, uh, yeah, low entry or entry. It's, it's easy, accessible. And with the Speedmaster as well, you can buy Speedmaster for, I don't know, 1500 euros. Yeah. And it's, it's all good. And that's also the fun thing with Speedmasters. Also, when we do these events, you have people that have like, I don't know, 10 gold Speedmasters or really, the first references that go for uh, uh, like 200,000 or even more. Um, but they, they, these people, these, these diehard collectors that are fortunate enough to have these, these items, they also respect you that just have the normal Speedmaster just bought it new um, um, from a retailer and you show up at, at one of these events. They don't look down on you, uh, on you. They, they appreciate you for being there and showing interest in these watches. And I think that makes the difference. I think the type of person is what makes the difference. And I think a lot of other brands, they are more keen on, if you don't have the right handset, it's minus 2,000. If you don't have the right bezel, it's minus 5,000. It's a lot about money and collecting and putting a number on a watch. And also, there's also a lot of people that, that really try to hide their own watches and talk down other people's watches because they want to to show that only their watches have a certain value or something. Uh, I don't know. I, it's a lot of miss, miss, uh, I don't know. It's, it's uh, the, f a lot of wrong reasons for collecting is going on as well. And I think you, if you keep that clean, I think you have a good, a good chance to, to have a nice community around a certain watch. And with the Speedmaster, I think it's really honest and clean. And of course, people try to hype their stuff on, on ghost bezels and tropical dials, and it's all fun. But you don't necessarily have to go that route. I mean, it's also fine if you just come up with a, with a nice Speedmaster and have a good story for yourself uh, with this watch, that you bought it when you were 20 or 25 or whatever, and you travel the world around it. I think that's as valuable as a person that just sits on 100 Speedmasters. You know, it's... Um, that makes all the difference for me, to be honest. The, the story and the reason why someone bought a Speedmaster. What is it for you, Balash? How did it came about that you are into Speedmaster? Was it the same reason? I, I, I actually, I can't really tell you um, a specific moment that happened. I, as RJ said, I, from the earliest times that I was interested in watches, and I think I've always been interested, but I think it started probably around 
I was 17, 18, or maybe started to go to college. And I realized that, yeah, you know, there are brands, cool brands out there, Breitling, Rolex, uh, Omega. But the one, the one brand <clears throat> that was interesting to me, and it could be because of James Bond, because of, uh, because of uh, a golden eye, because I remember um, to my generation, I was born in 84. So to my generation, golden eye was um, a movie that I saw as a young teenager and I remember the watch so that the brand probably the brand image probably um just stuck with me and then I started to look into these four or five hundred dollar watches and and I had a bunch of those Genevs and Seamasters and so on and then the next logical step was a Speedmaster and I like the Speedmaster for the look I like that it's simple it's elegant I like that it looks virtually the same as it looked in 68 and 69 um you know it's pretty much like a sub you, you look at a sub from the 80s and 60s, yeah. more or less, it looks the same as it does today. The Speedmaster is even better in this case. Um, and I just started reading and, um, and I was frequent in the same um, forum as RJ was. I think he was kind of getting out of the forum when I was getting in around 2006, 7, 8. Um, and I just read, 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 read. And then I had my... My first PD, I think, was from 1985, and then the other one was 2006, and it was 2012, and I was like, I really want a, a vintage one. So I, I sold my then new one, or six-year-old one, to get a vintage one, which was at the same time, at, at that time, the same price. Yeah. Which is from 1968. Now it's not the same price anymore. And, um, and that's how I came to Fratello, because I was reading about the, the you know, the Speedmaster on the forums, and then you saw the, the threads and you saw this article was linked and that article was linked and, and I went on the article and I realized, okay, it's the same website again or the same blog again and again and again. And, um, and that's how, how we, we linked up with, with RJ and then Betty at the time and, and Frida. then the first time I met them, we started, as I said, when I started writing in July and the first time we met was in September. And funnily enough, that was the, the um, release of the um, Speedy, was it the Speedy Tuesday book, the first one. I'm not Speedy Tuesday, sorry, the um, Speedmaster. Uh, oh, we, did, we did an event around that in Amsterdam in the boutique. Yeah. And I think that was the first time you came to us, yeah. It was the first time. I, I, at the time, I still uh, lived in Scotland and I flew from Edinburgh to uh, Amsterdam. And that was the first time we met. Um, there was an event later that day in the, in the boutique. When um, one of the writers from um, the book was there, and and that was the first time we met, so it also revolves around the Speedmaster. And of course, as RJ said, 2016 we saw the first prototypes of the the uh, Speedy Tuesday, and it was really a, a fun thing how we saw it. And I don't want to get into the details, but it was like kind of a secret uh, project. I think even within Omega, not, not a lot of people knew about it, and um, then 2017, it was released, and you know the whole story that came after. It was a, it's been yeah. a great ride. What about the third one? <laughs> Can you tell me something about? <laughs> Ask him. Well, <laughs> there will not be a third one this year, as we um, um, uh, uh, said a few times and published a few times. We don't want to. We don't want to do a Speedy Tuesday every year. Basically, we want to do something when we have a great idea and something cool for for uh, for a design. Um, we don't want to do one every year or just for the sake of it. It has to make sense. And it needs to be a watch that we would, would love to have ourselves as well. And that was the case with the Speedy Tuesday 1 and the Speedy Tuesday 2, the Ultraman. And yeah, we, we, there's something in the works. Uh, it's not for this year, but we are going back and forth in ideas and ideas and, and, and designs and thoughts on, uh, on what, we, what we would love to see and how we would love to have it done. Because we also learned from the previous uh, introductions that um, not everything went smooth. There are some things that could could have been done better. But yeah, you have to to try it at some point and see what happens. And I think we did two times. The second the second watch already went better than the first one. And I think for the third one, perhaps we come up with a different solution or idea that makes it more. Uh, fair or more um, uh, that you have more chance to own uh, to own one or buy one so all these ideas and things we put it in a mix and uh, as soon as we we have something cool we uh, yeah we will uh, you will know rg rg means it's, it's going to be a quartz lady speedmaster this time 
Yeah. Will be a limited edition again, or is there any chance that it will be? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of negativity around limited editions. Um, at, at, on the one hand, I get it because in the past, if you look at really old articles on Fratello, when the I think when the I think, uh, even the, the the first Snoopy or one of these watches came out, I made some remarks about oh, again a limited edition, and I see the same remarks today by people. But on the other hand. I'm a Speedmaster, I collect watches, I buy watches, but purely as a collector, I collect Speedmasters because you have to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> um, and the thing is, I have my moon watches, I have my regular moon watch and I have my regular moon watch from today, from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, until the 60s. Um, but if you have those, it's also nice to have some variation. So I like it when a limited edition comes out that are really fancy. And I don't buy all limited editions. I only buy those ones that I like. And I think that's the healthy way of looking at things. Buy the things that you like, not because they are a limited edition or a special edition or a numbered edition. If you don't like it, but it's a limited edition, you should not buy it. Have someone else have it that really likes the watch. Um, and I think that's, that's my angle of buying watches and limited editions. I don't buy watches because they are a limited editions. I, I, I buy a watch because I love it. And um, so I, as long as you do it that way, it's fine. And what I also notice is a lot of people that complain about the limited editions are the people that that don't buy these watches in the first place anyway. It's it's easy to bitch about a brand or a model that you're not into anyway. But I think the people that are really into the Speedmasters, they embrace a nice edition. And, and if they don't like it, then they don't buy it. It's, it's super easy. Um, so to answer your questions, uh, a question about it, we don't know yet. I mean. On the one hand, it makes sense that it's a limited edition because you also, also for the brand, because you want to have the momentum. I think the momentum is very important. If you want to have something, some, some, something as a commercial success, you need to offer it for a certain amount of time or a certain limited amount of watches, because then there's the pressure on people to buy it right now and not tomorrow or wait another week. Um, so that makes a difference. And of course, for some watches, that's more important or under time pressure than other watches. If you have a popular watch like a Speedmaster, there's more time pressure than if you do, I don't know, a Jägerle Kultra with a red dial, which is nice and it can be limited, but what's their audience? It's not thousands of people. So it, 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 there's no real pressure. Um, so yeah, it could be a limited, could be a numbered, I don't know. We don't decide. I like the idea of 2012 pieces because uh, yeah, we, we did the first two in 2012 pieces as well. And um, yeah, perhaps you want to have a trio of Speedy Tuesday watches, 2012 pieces each. Uh, I don't know. And perhaps there will be a Speedy Tuesday 4 that's not limited. I, all options are open. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing that's being discussed, yeah. It brings me to the next uh, topic, actually, um, watches and wonders, um, like your top and flop um, releases. Yeah. Maybe flop is a bit mean, but... Uh, we cannot laugh every watch. So no, I, I didn't like the whole um, the whole thing because um, it is the first time that I didn't go to uh, Geneva to see the watches and handle the watches. And now we got pre only Cartier. They sent us some watches up front under embargo, which was fine because then at least you had a feeling and a sense with the watch. You could experience the watch a bit mm -hmm. because I think that's the added value of a title like like Fratello or the Chrono 24 magazine, for example, that you can fiddle around with watches and, 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 make, and create an opinion or generate an opinion about this watch before you write it down. And now we had to base our articles on, on the press releases that they sent. And everyone was using the same pictures and I didn't really feel involved in the whole thing. And that was a bit of a letdown. Um, so it was like a, a weekend long vomit of watch news Okay. And I really, I really disconnected that weekend. We, we did a lot of preparations for the articles. We, we published a lot of articles. And I feel a bit sad for the brands because they don't deserve, they don't deserve this because they really, some really make nice, nice products, but it became something artificial. It became something without really real substance. It were uh, watches on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a picture, on a stock picture and not pictures that were taken uh, by, by uh, either photographers or journalists that, that, that show the watch more like they are 
when you when you wear the watches with with reflections because they're all photoshopped to death so all the reflections are out and it becomes a bit more or less of a of a dull depth product and i that's that's something that i i really missed and i i discon disconnected at some point with the whole watches and wellness thing during that weekend but i have my favorites um but because it was like this vomit of of releases some brands they just tossed everything over the fence that they had like Cartier, for example uh, they just released everything and then it becomes really difficult to to remember um all, all the watches that they did and i think that's what lange did really well um they released only two products only two watches two references the zeitwerk um uh and the and the Odysseus um with a strap and i think that's cool because those two i really remember and you get to focus on these watches because it's something different and it's only two releases to, so you can really put more more uh, more effort into reading reading the press release properly and looking at the videos that the brands uh, did um so those two they i remember them i'm not a really an odysseus fan i had an interview with the head of uh, product development anthony de haas and he explained a bit more about it so that that opened me up a bit more to the watch but it's just not my watch and i really love the sidewalk but it's only 30 pieces and they are like, i think between 400 and 500 thousand euros so that's not going to happen at least not this year um, <laughs> um i like the um, Jigler culture they had the master control series new and they also released like i don't know five or six models and it's a bit of a boring watch and i think Jigler culture needs to be very careful that they don't become a brand that dies with its customers so it needs to it needs to do something something fresh and something nice and i think the master control chronograph calendar is the one i like best because it's the, the least master control looking watch and a lot is happening on the dial while it's still uncluttered and quite clean so i really like that one and uh, i have to say i like the rose gold panerai uh, luminar with the blue dial that was awesome yeah I like one the dmls i think that's, that's cool. yeah they really did a nice job and i like the way that panerai is going i had panerai in the past so i was a bit of a paneristi uh, 15 years ago um if i would have if i would buy one today I, it would be a submersible because i i changed my direction a bit i think a submersible is really cool uh, but i really like the luminar in gold i think it's it's good and i like the direction that they do because they have much more into into innovation with with materials and and uh they i have been to the panerai manufacture and they do a lot of testing they do a lot of uh stuff with their watches uh, uh testing the finishing is super nice the movements are nice they just don't really advertise with it um I, I i feel i think they still advertise with their heritage of 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 the italian navy and so on which is a cool thing but you also need to show how good your watches are and i think they should show it a bit more because they are really good watches um and i think the panerai of today is much more a different product than it was 15 years ago when i bought my luminar marina and luminar base um so that's an interesting brand interesting releases um yeah i think those are the uh three that really stuck with me basically a piaget i don't care for they also come always come up with the ultra extra i don't know what thin and these watches they hardly work or they're all concept watches that they they won't they won't even let, let you try on the wrist because they're too scared that it breaks and they have this red carpet video vomit that I really don't care about. Um, but um, yeah, for the rest, I, I have to say um, nothing really stuck. Like Bon Marché, I don't know. The, the Mont Blanc had some nice stuff. The Mona Pusher is nice. I think the Clifton, the Bon Marché, the Clifton is. I think it's a pretty. It's good. nice and with the Bometic, but I think there are some 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 design things there that I really I don't fancy to be honest and um, I don't think they presented themselves well um, Mont Blanc the same I think they did a whole presentation no Mont Blanc was okay there was one brand from um, the Richemont group that did the whole presentation on video in French and then I think people it's an international event it's a digital event uh, do it in English if you, it doesn't make sense to do it it was ridiculous um so i think the whole setup was a bit awkward to be honest and that's not the fault of the brands it's the situation so i feel bad for them 
um, but it also led to the thing that I only remember a few pieces that really stood out for me. Yeah. What about you, Wilnes? Um, I'll well, go back. I think, well, given the, the situation, I think um, it was interesting to see what they did with the website. Um, because they could have just said, you know, we're going to send out a press releases and, and you just deal with it. And they tried to do this online platform where you could, as a journalist, you could sign in and then you could see all the brands in the videos. And I think it was interesting. It was definitely incomparable to the, to the, to being mm -hmm. here. Um, this is out of the question. And, and I have to say when we're in Geneva for SIHH or when it was at SIHH, that was a crazy week. It was really a week when we got up in the morning, got nine o'clock there because we had the schedule and we were there until literally the, the party started. We I remember coming out of some of the some of the meetings and the and the other booths already had the party ongoing and we were just leaving from a presentation. Um given that you go all the presentations and we did. Yeah. So um so it was it was a shame that obviously this was not happening. And I think they did a great job in, in creating this online space. But as RJ said, um, you go into Cartier's, um, for example, Cartier's uh, folder or whatever, and it's like 190 images. Yeah, like, where to start? It's <laughs> like, yeah. First of all, you have it, uh, the press release in PDF and Word file in eight to 10 languages. And then 190 images. And I, at one point, I didn't even know which one was like was it a new watch or what? and then it was a they put in the the historical piece as a comparison but it was also photoshopped so it looked kind of new and i think iwc did it with the with the portuguese and like oh that's a nice new watch oh wait a second no that's the historical piece so um that was that was it was just too much and i think it was too much because because we had to digest the whole stuff ourselves and because they just yeah just you know bomb this with the watches i also like the lange i think none of them are new of course um there's a new color and there's a new strap and um i think they're interesting i think Lange is always interesting uh, i also like the master control all of them from the simple time only all, all four of them i like some of the vacherons i like the um the one that i wrote also about um six, huh? the six yeah the 56 um both the time only and the and the um the complicated version um some of the independents i'm trying to think if, if there was anything they got um, under snowed a bit i feel hmm? they got a bit under snowed i feel yeah. the rest yeah. and that was the pity because these richemont brands they they they, they kept flowing so many watches that uh, yeah and everybody yeah. wants to cover them obviously for obvious reasons because it's good to be in a good graces with richmond so you want to cover the mont Blancs and the jlc's and the Vacherons, which makes sense that's no problem but if if every title and every big title covers the same six brands mostly and the iwc's and whatever then yeah what's going on with with all the the the, the auto luxury indie pieces which in the carré when when it was a carré again you could just walk around if you had like an hour and you finish your article and you could walk around and you meet this guy and, and go there and Moser was there and Armstrong was there and you know everybody HYT and whatever you could stop and talk to this guy and, oh have you seen this piece um, I mean I'm not complaining because obviously it was not possible this year and we didn't know how it would have looked if they had it I mean watches and you wonders could fiddle around with the watches I think this yeah this, this event this this digital watches and wonders it proved for me a discussion that was going on for a longer time also with the stuff going on with Basel that there is a need for these shows you cannot do without shows because a lot of people said oh Basel we, who, who needs them anyway because you can do everything digital and retailers can order online we can get the press releases no I really want to see and experience the watches because otherwise I don't can I can't form an opinion about a watch and write about it. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I think that's what what readers value is that they value our opinion, our views, and they can they can agree or disagree with it, but at least they have some some thing, things to think about when reading about this watch, and they have some different opinions uh, opinions about these watches. And it's super difficult to to create an opinion based on a picture. And I think this digital watch you is no longer. You shouldn't. No, 
you should not you, do you, it. Can, you can just basically state the facts this is the size this is the movement based on my press release as we know yeah. this is the, the strap and but that's it but you cannot say it's head heavy or the it's the, the bracelet is flimsy it looks good on a 7.5 inch wrist or whatever and and a lot of the times I'm if you I agree Right. Yes, and, and you don't want to state only the facts because people don't buy watches based on, on, on specs only. At least I pity those who do. But you need to, to, to see something in the flesh. And even if you write about it, I always advise to people go to a retailer or whatever, try to watch because you really need to experience the watch. And it's not a laptop that you have like two columns in your Excel sheet where you compare the specifications of each. It doesn't work like with, with, with luxury things like this that you really... You want to love it, right? I mean, um, and it means you need to feel it and touch it and try it on your wrist. And I think that still goes, even if you can do a lot online. And of course, we are an online title. Um, but still, I think this is an element, the touch and feel sessions with these brands that, that, that can't be discontinued. So there is a need for this. So there's a need for Watches and Wonders. There's a need for a Basel World or, I don't know, a successor of Basel World. Uh, you cannot do without. Do you think that this is the future of events that we have purely online events? Because as we speak, um, just the new... That's not an event, is it? Yeah, they called it an online I can, I Sure, but I can watch a video because in, if you went into the Watches and Wonders uh, press thingy, there were all the videos. I'm not going to watch a video of the CEO of Lange, then the CEO of Jäger, then the CEO of... I this. did. Well, <laughs> I, I watched the first two or three, but then I was not interested anymore, you know? Yeah. Because... Okay, cool. I'm, I have access to the videos and the press press material, but yeah, at the end of the day, is there a reason? Um, no, you miss you miss the connection. You miss the involvement if exactly. you're not at these these shows. And I think if we would only could do this job based on what Watches and Wonders did this year, so only digital, yeah. I would start looking out for a different job. To be honest, it's no fun. I think I think they, as I said, they did a really great job given the time that they have to do something and, and, what, the, and the resources that they had in. in right. So in what they, they they had um, the time and the resource and all that stuff they had. They really did a good job um, compared to Basel World, who talks about investing so much money in a digital platform which is non-existent. Um, so I don't know where they, the money went that they invested, but that's a different story. Um, but but yeah, it's I've got feeling there. <laughs> Well, yeah. champagne. Ch uh, well, that's not even champagne in Basel. You have more champagne in, in Geneva than you have in Basel. But, um, but no, but it's absolutely, it's absolutely truth. I mean, people, a lot of times when we write about watches and write about reviews, you cannot really write enough about the watch because you write the review. And I think this is how I work. And I think all of us, we have like a, a blueprint in our minds like, okay if it's a watch review it has to be this and this and this the movement yeah. the case the dial, the pro. but there's always something like and how does it look on the wrist and is it not heavy and how thick it is on under the cuffs so people really as rj said they really want to know what we feel and if yeah. i don't see the watch and what can i say oh i can see what's in the press release but then again i can just take the press release copy paste and that's it i don't know more about that i can give you some historical background but i've not seen the watch i've not touched the watch i don't feel the pusher I don't feel the flimsiness of the bracelet or lack of. Um, I don't know the stories, the anecdotes from the designers, which is not in the press release, but they tell you during the presentation yeah. or get a good feeling in general about the brand because the CEO is an awesome person or lack of, like we have with certain brands, uh, or get your iPhone screen broken, you know, like we know in some cases it happens. So... Now, all jokes aside, you know, it's, it, it, it has to be part of it. And yeah, you, you need to be there. And I think also when we have the product presentations and you have the one-on-one the, the, the -on -one sessions with brands and product developers, you can really ask follow-up questions about the watch. You have the watch in your hand and then you can ask questions. Like we did, very, very good example is the Speedmaster Tintin because it was, it was introduced as a Speedmaster Racing in 2013. And we sat there, we had the first appointment of the first day on Basel World with them, with Omega. And we said, and I said to the, to, to the designer, I said, this is, not a, this is not a racing. That doesn't make sense. What is it? And then he came up with the story about Hergé and Tintin. And we broke the story and we came with the name Tintin for this watch. And it would, perhaps it would not have been out there because if it would only be digital, Omega would say, okay, this is a new Speedmaster Racing. And it would not have made sense because nobody would have asked the question, what's the real story about this watch? 
And I think that's what you need. It's not only uh, like Bala said, it's, it's true. You, you, you need to feel the watch and see how it wears on the wrist. Is it not too thick or too heavy or whatever? But it's also about asking questions to the developers, the CEOs, the brand representatives about these watches and products to get the, the story out. And I think in a lot, a lot of occasions, it's a story that, that makes a watch even cooler. Then they had they happy to talk about this most of the exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you you could do this you could do these things. Right? You could do schedule uh I and I did uh interviews with the brand CEOs or designers and it's all fun and nice, but it's not at the same time. It's after the digital uh watches and wonders um event, like a few days after, and then the moment is a bit gone. And I appreciate these interviews and they give input and food for thought, but yeah, the moment is a bit gone, and that's that's a pity. So, like Balar said, I, re, I I might sound a bit negative, but I really appreciate the effort that they did. But for me, it was the proof that we need events and shows like this. Absolutely. I mean, this time, to be fair, they had no, no real chance to do it different. But where do you think, or what? Where do you see this thing? I think they could have done it different in hindsight, but that's always in hindsight. I think. They could have, what they could have done is make sure that they have enough uh, samples. So normally they only have a few samples, but they could have made a, a few more samples, send it around under embargo because we have to sign NDAs anyway. I always draw a house or put a cross, but you, you have to sign these NDAs anyway, and then send the watch that we can go hands on with it. And at the same time, we, we could have done a Zoom interview with the CEO or the product developer so we could really create a, a nicer and a better story up front instead and take our own pictures and video instead of rehashing press releases and using their stock images. Maybe timing was different, yeah. Yeah, but you're right. I, I think there's potential to do it. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of talks about these events, you know, especially when the Basel World uh, uh, telenovela was unfolding, episode one, two, three, four. Um, when you had the villains and then you have the good guys and everybody was like, yeah, well, maybe we don't need it anymore. Yes, we do need it. I, I, this, and that's RJ said, we need a Geneva. We need, we need the Basel world or whatever the name is and whatever the location is. Dude, I don't care about the eight euro sausages. I mean, I take that for granted. We really need the, these shows and whether it's Basel world or a different name, I really don't care. But these brands need to have a place where they exhibit. Absolutely. I because think, if you think about it, there's a lot of journalists who come across, you know, the US or, or from Asia, they're not going to travel four or five times a year. It was a, it, it would have been the best thing to do Watches and Wonders and Basel would back to back. It would have been even better to do one big event with all the brands. If it's possible or not, that's, that's debatable. But we're just talking, you know, just shooting ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Because the brands are there. The, the, the CEOs are there, the press is there, the retailers are there once, maybe for a week, maybe for 10 days. We did it in Basel. I remember my first Basel with Fratello. I, I lost four kilos, even though I had a, I was fed very nicely during the evenings, but it was a lot of running. And, you know, then you had hole one, you had hole two, hole three, A, B, you had the, the palace and God knows what. And then you had all the brands like Fortis or Junkans were not at Basel World, but in Basel. And you were running up and down, and then you went to the Trois Run, and you came back, and it, it was it was, and you you all know you've all been there. It, it was crazy, but it was fun. It was but fun, it was, but it was also necessary. And I I really realized that a few weeks ago with the Watches and Wonders, that was the first time that I really realized we need these shows. Yeah. When I, well, before I went to Basel, the first Basel, I was talking to RJ. I remember, and I and we, I don't know with some brands and this and that, and he said, "Don't worry." after Basel, we, we would get a lot of ammo. And it's true. And he said, he used the word ammo. And it's true. I had ammo for a whole year. And I was never, you know, I was never in, in, uh, in need of a, of a new watch or a new contact because I just got so many information, so many models and so many watches. Yeah. It was just crazy. So it, it, and it was really beneficial for us. And if it's beneficial for us, it's beneficial for the readers because we do this for the readers. And, and they're the ones who are going to consume it. And they're the ones who are going to buy the watch because I can buy the watch and you can buy the watch. That's 10, 15, 100 journalists. But there's hundreds of thousands of people who are buying watches based on hopefully partly on our, our assessments as well. And they do. And they do. And, I, and we, also, we all feel responsible for what we write and what we do because if people buy a watch and we don't report it right, um, 
it, it doesn't feel good, to be honest. Mm. Um, so it's important, I think, that we really get hands on. Yeah. Well, now that the news dropped today that Basel will not um, happen in 2021. I'm not convinced because it doesn't say that. Or it, the press release says it, it will not happen. It will not happen on the planned dates from January 28th to February 2nd. So it doesn't mean that it, it will not happen in 2021. Um, another thing is they, they, they will come up with something. I think they, in the same press release, they stated that they will do like this brainstorm session or whatever, also with exhibitors to come up with a new format or a new, new concept for it, uh, perhaps a different name. And I think that would be a good way forward. But I also feel and fear that as long as the management doesn't change, nothing much will change because I think Basel World was killed not only by COVID-19, but also by the greed that they showed. I mean, imagine, we, well, oh, sorry to interrupt, I remember it was, it was already in the air two years ago. When it was I had pulled out. Or even yeah, already talking about this. And then the next year came and they, everybody was surprised. And then again, they talked about it and nothing happened. And then the next year came and then COVID was just like the last, uh, yeah. the last nail in the coffin. They, 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 weren't, they weren't showing flexibility. And I think when Hayek pulled out because he said, I don't want to, sp to, to spend 60 million Swiss francs for one week for, for this. And we have to pay extra if we want to have our own uh, Wi-Fi uh, receiver or whatever, whatever it's called. Or when we have, want to have an additional television that we have to pay extra. The guy is already paying 60 million Swiss francs. It should be, be all for free, including the catering service. And he's bringing 15 francs. It, it's, 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 greed. It. it's greed all over. And I think that killed them. And they didn't want to let go of these of this pricing structure and uh, they try to 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 uh, schmooze a bit with uh, us journalists on what what they could do better and so on but in the end nothing was really uh, finalized and and they i think they just want to to go on in the same uh, direction as they always did so i think it, it's greed that killed them and as long as the same people are on board and on the board so to speak i'm afraid that it will not really change i don't think they will often change oh perhaps we should ask less money and then go forward no it's too late for that do you think there will be more smaller events maybe also in cooperation with for example blogs like um fratello hodinki monochrome whatever do you yeah perhaps i i mean you see that already i mean we do we do novelty events with with some brands so we we in, in cooperation with a boutique or a brand we show the novelties to our readers so that, that's something that you can do but you also need something on a larger scale yeah. and that you can do things local, but since there are no real borders anymore in terms of when things come out, you need to have something centralized as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's really necessary. I guess. And I hope that they will find a way even with Basel World and perhaps it's called Basel World. I don't care, but that they come up with something nice next year for the brands that really need it, the smaller brands, the, the independent brands. I mean, Swatch Group has the power to do, to do their own stuff. Rolex has the power to do their own stuff or go somewhere else. But I think there are a lot of small brands. Uh, think of Nomos or Sin or uh, Oris um, or even the smaller ones, the, the micro brands or the startups that they really need to the exposure of these, these events. So I hope that they will come up with something that's um, workable for them and yeah. also economically um, uh, interesting and, and uh, feasible. Maybe. Do you think we will see more novelties at events like Dubai Watch Week? Maybe that they. Yeah, Dubai Watch Week is not really a novelty show. They have some special releases for the, the Middle Eastern market, but Dubai Watch Week is more for um, journalists with panel talks and uh, interviews with with industry people. Um, so it's more like a networking event and an event where you get ideas for for content yeah. than it is for novelties. Uh, what LVMH did earlier this year was interesting. They also did it in Dubai, the LVMH Watch Week. And I think that was an interesting concept. Um, but it was also small scale and only a few people per title could, could attend. Um, and come on, it's Swiss watch industry, so it makes sense to do something in Switzerland, right? I mean, 